much. Robert. And finally, our final speaker, um, Anthony Hodges from the West, UNICEF West Africa region <coughs> to make some comments on the presentations. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, if I could start, I would like actually just again to, to thank um, ODI and particularly the research team that, that carried out this work. Um, I mean, I was involved in, in commissioning and uh, interacting with the, the uh, authors of this work uh, all the way through this process over the last year and a half. But I really must say, I think that this, this is a tremendous piece of research. The, the five reports that have been distributed uh, here today are on sort of five thematic dimensions of, of the research at a regional level. There are, in addition, five country uh, case study reports on Senegal, Ghana, Mali, Equatorial Guinea, and Congo. So it's a tremendous body of work which is, uh, that has uh, come out of this, uh, this big uh, uh, research investment. And I, and I would, you know, I'd like to just um, emphasize in a way um, that in addition to them just being general knowledge products, the, these, these reports and the process of producing them have really been very important in, in kick-starting a lot of thinking in the region and contributing to, to policy development and even uh, concrete operational program development, uh, particularly in those uh, five countries where the, where the case studies were, were carried out. If I can give a, just a couple of examples, in, in, in Senegal, the, the UNICEF uh, office there is working now very closely with the government uh, to do the feasibility planning for the introduction of a universal uh, child benefit uh, for all children under the age of five. And this is really now at a quite an, an advanced uh, stage. Mali was mentioned by the UNICEF regional director earlier on, but very significant that the, the report um, on, on Mali was launched at a national forum that was opened by the prime minister himself. And there was an agreement at the end of the forum to develop a five-year action plan for the strengthening of social protection in Mali, which will probably include, again, some form of, of cash transfer for the, for the poor, um, along with the development of, uh, of a health insurance system, which is called the uh, Assurance Maladie Obligatoire, the mandatory health insurance. Um, in Equatorial Guinea, where it's been pointed out, uh, the oil resources provide the financial wherewithal uh, to set up a much great, you know, stronger social protection system, uh, which would help to address the terribly bad human in, uh, development indicators in that country. Again, it was the Deputy Prime Minister who came to the, to the workshop that was held just a few weeks ago, and a, a declaration, Declaration of Malabo, was issued at the end of the meeting um, uh, proposing uh, various measures for the strengthening of social uh, protection. In Ghana, um, where we've been involved quite deeply, uh, particularly in supporting the, the LEAP cash transfer program, more is being done there in terms of, um, of uh, strengthening the monitoring and evaluation system, which um, Nicola mentioned, which is very weak or more or less non-existent at the moment, so that the real lessons of that program uh, can, be, can be generated, the evidence generated, so that um, the arguments can be made about impact and cost effectiveness, which is so necessary in order to win the political support and the budgetary allocations uh, for, for scale up. Um, so in, in all these countries, uh, a lot is being done. I could, should mention Congo as well, where again, forum held in Congo led to, with a large number of ministries represented, uh, ended with, a, with agreement on a series of recommendations, including there the launching of a universal child benefit uh, in the Congo, where again it would be uh, really quite affordable at less than 2% of GDP, um, but would require uh, substantial uh, capacity uh, strengthening. So these reports have really played a very pivotal role in moving this whole agenda forward. We, we plan to build on that, uh, supporting through our social policy staff in UNICEF offices around the region to work with governments now to take this policy forward, uh, agenda forward and to really start to, to strengthen and develop uh, where they don't already exist um, effective uh, operational uh, uh, programs. Um, I think one of the key, key points that has really come out so strongly in the presentations today, but in all of this research, 
is the, the importance of the child dimension of, uh, of social protection. That uh, so, ch social protection is particularly important for children precisely because children themselves are more vulnerable than adults. And the kinds of deprivations and shocks um, that children in Western Central Africa are subjected to can be even life-threatening. Or where they're not in and of themselves um, leading to, to death, um, nonetheless can, can um, inflict damage on children that has life course repercussions. In other words, that children who are poorly nourished in the early years of life, if they do survive, that will affect their, their, their physical and, and uh, mental development and their future capacities uh, as adults. And the same is also true for those children who are denied access to school or who drop out of school. These things will have lifelong uh, implications. By the very same token, investments in social protection that make it possible for children to ensure adequate nutrition, uh, for families to ensure adequate nutrition for their children and to ensure that children are able to go to school and to access health <laughs> services and so on, these will have a payoff in terms of investment over the very long term. They will help to meet child rights in the immediate sense, in the short term, um, and to reduce these deprivations. But they will also have very important um, uh, payoffs in the long term, and thereby, through a process of human capital development in a way, contribute to uh, uh, long-term poverty reduction and breaking the, breaking the, the intergenerational uh, transmission uh, of poverty. I think another point that's really come out again very strongly and again was stressed a lot by, by Nicola quite rightly, but it's, a, it's a, a, a thread running through all of these reports, is the multidimensionality of the risks that, are, that face children. The economic ones are terribly important and this is the justification for um, investing in cash transfers or in insurance schemes. But we mustn't lose sight, particularly in the case of children, of the social risks that they face. The loss of family, for example, as the unit for, for being brought up as a child, which can be threatened by uh, migration or um, extreme forms of fostering that border practically on trafficking, which is quite common in Western Central Africa, um, separation due to a conflict, uh, the HIV AIDS um, uh, uh, pandemic and, and so on. Problems to do with um, uh, deeply ingrained uh, social and cultural uh, practices, female genital mutilation or cutting, which is very widespread among certain ethnic groups in, in West Africa in particular, um, and the problem of early marriage, of uh, the fact that still a very large proportion of children in this region are married um, before the age of 18, and in fact very large numbers even before the, the age of 15. This underscores, I think, the need for a whole panoply of kinds of measures. The, the cash transfers and the insurance are terribly important, particularly to address the economic problems, but also social welfare services and accompanying legislation in order to address some of these uh, other kinds of risks that, that children uh, face. If I could just um, add, um, I mean, uh, just to perhaps comment on, on one or two of the uh, of the kind of contextual factors that I think make social protection such a big challenge in this region. Um, and they've been, they've been uh, alluded to, I think, in passing. I think the first is just the very extent of poverty in this region. Poverty is so widespread that it raises issues about how you go about social protection. And um, I mean, Bob was just uh, referring to the, perhaps the arguments for, for more universal approaches it's very difficult to know exactly whom to target in a country where 50, 60, or 70% of the population are living below the poverty line, and maybe 25 or 30% of the population are below the extreme uh, food uh, poverty line. The, what we've noticed is that um, governments have, re I mean, have re you can react to this in one of two ways, really. One is to go the universal approach um, and not bother with targeting because is it worth the enormous administrative complexity of targeting half your population um, or a third of, of your population? The other response has been to go to much finer targeting to much narrower groups of extremely vulnerable people. And that, that's what we're seeing 
I think with some of the cash transfer programs in countries like Ghana and and um, and uh, Sierra Leone and so on is in Nigeria. You're seeing programs that are that are targeted at what you might call the the ultra poor and ultra vulnerable, um, often using these categorical um, um, forms of targeting orphans and vulnerable children. But basically, HIV/AIDS affected uh, children, um, extremely um, uh, severely disabled and uh, more or less destitute uh, elderly people. But a lot of questions there are arising about it, whether this is not missing out large numbers of other households and children who are also really very poor and very vulnerable, but don't necessarily fit exactly into those, uh, into those categories. Um, a second, a second issue that has arisen really is about fiscal space. This is a region where there's, you know, in, for the low-income countries, a lot of very tight fiscal constraints. These are countries which have made progress in the last few years. They, they receive debt relief, a lot of them, though, though not all. Um, and they have been pursuing more stringent macroeconomic policies and have been relatively successful, quite a few of them, in restoring their macroeconomic uh, balances. But they're now facing new threats uh, as a result of the, of the global crisis. So clearly for these countries, it is quite difficult. But, be, but we should not exaggerate, I think, the, the constraints that, that we're talking about here. If you take the case of Ghana, which I think is an, is an interesting one, uh, as Nicola pointed out, the, um, or, or Rebecca, I can't remember, or both maybe, um, the, the, the present ambition is really quite, um, is quite limited. It's to reach one-sixth of the extreme poor within five <laughs> years. But that would only cost 0.1% of Ghana's GDP, according to the, the feasibility um, estimates that were, were prepared when LEAP was, uh, was designed. It would be possible to extend LEAP at least to all of the extreme poor, which is about 18% of the population in Ghana, for less than 1% of gross domestic product. And I would argue that in a country like Ghana, that would be affordable in the long term. It's something that it would have to be built up to, but it's something that would be affordable, and it would make an enormous impact on the life of households and children um, in extreme poverty. As has been, I'm coming, just coming to that, as has been pointed out, in the countries that can afford it, like the oil-rich ones, then the universal approaches are better because they're administratively much easier. They would avoid uh, the big exclusion errors that go along with, with forms of targeting. And there I should point out some very interesting simulations were done in these reports, which you can see in, uh, particularly in the reports on fiscal space and on cash transfers. But they show that the exclusion errors by using, for example, proxy means testing would range from one-tenth to one-quarter of, of the poor who were targeted. So there are real problems with targeting, which is the argument for using universal approaches, I think, where, where, where they're feasible. The last and final point, which again I think has come through all of these presentations and very strongly in the report, is that strengthening the administrative capacity for the design, delivery, monitoring and evaluation of programs is really essential that we're not just talking about fiscal space and whether the money is available. We're talking about whether there's the political commitment to protect the most vulnerable uh, in these countries and whether there is the administrative capacity to be able to deliver these programs effectively and reach uh, the most vulnerable uh, families and, and children. Thank you. Okay, thank you.